What's up, guys? Welcome to Agua's in 10, uh, season four, episode four, Wednesday Adam's Mother's Day. That's why I'm wearing actually very similar to my mother's um shirt, uh, Mother's Day pink. So yeah, happy Mujin Jia, Dio de Madre, or Mother's Day um, Eve, I guess. So to really celebrate the Mother's Day, I talk about very two very powerful um, feminine heroes of mine, uh, Lady Gaga, and of course, the Wednesday Adams Netflix um, leader, uh, Jenna Ortega, and also a very great mother from the Legend of Zelda series. Um, very great female real world figure, uh, Hilda from Low Rule. Without further ado, here's the Agos in 10 Mother's Day special. Tonight's episode is sponsored by nobody, but I want to just give thanks to my mom, Grace Lou. Uh, she's done a great job um, raising me as a son, and now finally me, alone and um, independent here in Orlando, Florida. It's great. Um, I have a good time, you know, having great cultural connection with my partner, um, with, with my mom. Um, Yusun and Guangdong have a good relationship. I actually had my first ever Shumai in uh, Orlando today, which is pretty awesome. And also, hopefully, uh, for Brandy Cole reasons, Jason Tatum drops a 50 burger against the Sixers in Game 7 tomorrow by this day. Without further ado, here is Diago's in 10 by this day. So, this episode has three main parts. And actually, now going forward, I'll actually be putting my solutions inside the um, algorithm in 10, so that we can actually see the solution where it comes from. So, here we go. Mother's Day, Wednesday, Adams and Hilda's Castle. So you can see this is uh, Jenna Ortega for Wednesday. Um, a bit of a, you know, Tim Burton special. And of course, here's the Low Rule Castle, High Rule Castle from Legend of Zelda. So normally I don't put a whole lot of the Nintendo references in Algos in 10. This is the first time since like all the way back in season one, we had the Zelda episode for the Armos Knights. So it's a nice throwback there. So this episode is all about respecting our dearest mothers, be my mother, Grace. We all code, code, code with our list, 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 with our trees, 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 like Algo said. That's really awesome. You know that song. I just, I just played that. Algos in 10 version of the Wednesday Adams. So I am a good singer, but not a very good choreographer. My partner at the hands is fantastic at both. So begin up always as customer for Igos in 10 with some lead code. So here's some refresher. Is this about trees? Pre-order, the root is on the left of tree. In order, the root is on center of tree. And post-order, the root is on right of tree. So why do I do trees for this Igos in 10? Let me show you. The reason why I chose trees is because a lot of tonight's episode will teach you a lot about conditional switch statements. There'll be a lot of cases and switches, decision trees, and also even within the um, within even the uh, Wednesday Adams portion, there's something called uh, dining philosophers, which is basically a semaphore mutex type of thing. And it also deals with trees and threads. And by the way, trees is my favorite uh, data structure in computer science because it's so easy to remember the uh, runtime of everything O log n. So here is a really simple warm up, you know, even your mother could solve binary tree in order traversal. This is something classic from my BU years, CS 112, uh, shout out Professor Snyder, and also um, my Northeastern Algos uh, retake, um, you know, shout out to Professor Viola, his YouTube channel is fantastic uh, for trees. To give it the root of a binary tree, return the in order traversal of its nodes values. For example, you have nodes one, two, and three. You have root one, null, which means you have nothing um, in the left, then two and three. Your output it should be one, three, then two. And by the way, if the root is empty, you basically return nothing, otherwise return one. So before I give you the solution, let me give us a little bit of a Mother's Day pop quiz actually for trees. So I'm gonna pull up the whiteboard here. Give me the inward traversal for this falling tree. This is definitely related to Mother's Day. So this is one circle. Here's another circle. 
and here's a duplicate circle. So you can already tell I'm basically writing a mom as part of a tree. So you can also do um, string characters for a tree traverse. Those don't have to be integers. So given this beautiful looking little tree, tell me very easily, what is the binary order of traversal? The answer should be very simple, but actually how it's done. So in order means you have the root in the top, right? So I'm going to go from the root. So I'm going to go from the root in the middle. So go M O M. So it's basically mom. And there you go. So M O M. There we go, mom. I know how to run the tree. So there goes the drawings. So let me show you the solution for the algorithm episode. This is a really easy solution. You have basically an order traversal with self and root. You have a values list to keep track of values. You have a recursion helper function. So trees are always recursive in nature. You'll see a lot of tonight's episode is quite recursive. It's like a lot of callbacks, a lot of stacks. Quite frankly, I'm surprised in the TypeScript part of the Hilda thing, which is like one of the um, FSC preparation problems I made for my Northeastern FSC course. It's actually quite interesting. It's uh, it's not easily um, running out of stack memory. So of course the tree is not return none. You then call recursion on the left. Then you append the root tree to val. You call recursion on the right. Return the root. Return value. It's like one of the easiest tree problems in like lead code algorithm history. That's it. Just like what ten lines of code. Even easier. You can also use a lambda expression recursion dot tree dot left plus values plus but. I don't want to overkill algorithm 10 too much. So you can write, write one of those crazy one-liners. But here's the thing I know is from work. And I've just finished the um, Tableau work for work and also using tree structures as well for my um, default directory. The less Jing or you know smart code you use, the better off you'll be. Because eventually you have to tell somebody, like for example, my partner who doesn't know country science or even my mom who vaguely knows how tree recursion works. Be able to explain like, somebody who does not know what how an even tree does and then you really have a good solution. You fail to do so, and you're disappointed from Mother's Day. So yeah, that is your solution for uh, the tree, episode, tree part of the episode. Now moving on to the actual coding of the episode. So this is the Wednesday Adams feat Dining Philosophers. So the Dining Philosophers is a classic systems uh, computing resource problem in computer science. I made it a little bit jazzed up. You know how in the uh, season one, episode four of the new Wednesday Adams, they have, you know, Janet Hager doing this, 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 da, 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 you know, that dance. I actually basically turned that dance into a straight up, you know, that problem. If you actually saw my um, Facebook Messenger story, I essentially made that as a preview and a lot of people liked it, which is pretty good. I've been learning how to use media in a less ideology fashion. So yeah, anyway, here's a little bit of a, um, Jen Ortega, Netflix hit throwback. Here's some of the rules. You have five prom goers, and this is also colloquially around May, which is usually in my Worcester Academy um, high school years, good time for prom basically, because graduation is around June, usually May after AP exams or whatnot. Um, God's people is taking AP exams post COVID. I know it's not very easy to, to do examination after COVID. Um, it's very important for us to you know chill out, relax, have fun, you know, work hard, play hard. So this is like a nice little prom back. I actually considered this song, um, the Bloody Mary as part of my WA prom. Back when Lady Gaga and uh, Pop were in the prime. So I'm very happy to see Jenna Ortega's Netflix show bring back this classic song, it's very good. And even though I'm Christian, um, it's sacrilegious to sing Bloody Mary, but I think it's just beautiful um, mel melodic tune, especially the choreography, it's just, Amazing. I don't do a whole lot of TikTok, but I do I do appreciate the uh the nice memes of it. So yeah, they hang out around the round table and on that round table with five individual seats. For your student at Nevermore Academy, which is the place where they go to school in the Indie series, they need two dance moves, which is the resources. Each person can dance, dance, dance with their hands, hands, hands around the round table. And of course, if spoiler alert they get covered in blood in end of end of the episode. To avoid essence worse than Jenna Ortega covered in blood. Principal Weems decided that we could not have more than two prompt goers dancing at the same time. And if you're not too lit after 
on the uh, playoffs and after, you know, Cinco de Mayo, you should understand what that means. That already says right there, mutex semaphore hint. The two prom goers dancing at the same time. So if it's like an AP exam, FAQ or something, or like a GRE exam question, you should be taking notes on this. That's like a good at testing. Like I used to suck at standardized testing, but um, after knowing how to do notes and context, it's a lot easier. That's even how I got my CK80 cert, basically, by like knowing what's, what's going on. And then dancing his random time till the prom is over. Of course, I have to show off your little highlight reels on Instagram, TikTok, social media. The uh, prom goers go do some more dance, dance, dance. And of course, to make sure this thing doesn't go kaput, we cannot have any duplicate dances between prom goers. So the solution is pretty simple. Uh, implement a semaphore-based Python solution to help Wednesday Adams and her classmates dance, dance, dance the night away. And I've just mentioned, this is a Worcester Academy prom choice of song I had. So I'll stop sharing my screen and tell you my solution. First with a whiteboard. So let's say for example, you got a nice round table for the prom. All right, then you got some dancers. You got dancer one, dancer two, dancer three, dancer four, and dancer five. So similar to dance philosophers, you can't have dancing going on between. You can't have any swaps going on between dance one, dance two, dance two, dance three. But for instance, we could do a bit of a, you know, a dance, 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 swap between dance five and dance three, and a sweep between uh, dance two and dance four. And you also cannot, you know, do any more because on course, if you're gonna do like swing in between dance, you gotta have, you know, catch a breath, take a break. So I give exactly one minute break between each dancer. So I'll give you guys a few minutes to think about the solution. If you're familiar with Downing Philosopher's problem, that's great. If not, I'll put in the description what that problem means. It's really a very basic problem of like determining how to not use your resources inappropriately, how to not deadlock dancers, how to not, you know, end up running out of resources. And the systems programming and back in Dell, I think this is very important in terms of understanding um, some threads. And now even here in um, my work at Open UHD, I decided to, you know, use more threads because it's helpful with file directory and like clocks and all that good stuff. I'm not a huge systems buff. So if you ask me for anything more detailed than that, I am gonna have to say, I'm sorry, ask my systems bros. But I know enough systems to be dangerous at work, which is good. So yeah, here's my solution for the uh, semaphore thingy. So this is a very interesting solution, by the way. So I have three imports in Python. Import threading, which allows you to do threads. Import random, which allows you to do random numbers. And then import time, which allows you to basically determine time. It's very similar to solution for Python regards to the den of dining philosophers by doing said dancing. So I have class dancer running a thread. I make sure as long as Principal Williams does not shut down the uh, prom dance, the running is true. I have an init function with a fork on left, fork on right. Fork is just a fancy term in systems like determine if you want to choose left term or a left or right right node. So I told you guys this thing is recursive. I wasn't kidding about it. This entire episode is straight up recursion with trees. That's the theme of Mother's Day. My mom and I love trees, and boy, if it was not for allergy season, I'd be probably planting a few trees right now and then. So I do a threading, uh, threading itself. This is just boilerplate thread stuff. Here's the fun one. So while we keep on dancing or running in this case, we sort of bust out some moves, you know, like let each dance move from Wednesday Adams be about a minute long. So like around the average TikTok highlight reel, about, you know, 60 seconds long. And then time by sleep will help you, you know, wait for 60 seconds. And then dancer dollar sign S, which is Python for its string, a self index is dancing and you keep on recursively calling the dance. Then this is the main function. You have dance self, you have fork one, fork two, fork dot left, fork dot right. And this is what gets a little interesting. So I'm gonna make some annotations here. So you have fork one here, fork two here. This is what I learned from BUCS 320, I mean 350 in regards to um, forking. So you first have fork that one acquire 
from fourth dot two. So fourth dot two is null. Then you have lock. So you have a lock for both forks, uh, fork one, fork two. Then fork dot one dot release. You release the fork that brings it back to fork two. And you swap forks. So why do you swap forks? Because here's the thing. It's sort of like you know a tug of war. If you tug on one side, you tug on another side, and you keep on tugging, eventually the rope is going to either snap, we're going to fall off into the river, or the rope is going to end up, you know, it'll be very taut. It'll be very hard to tug the rope. If you swap sides on the rope, however, you'll, you'll be equally able to be able to tug one side and the other side. So it's sort of like a tug of war between resources, between fork one, fork two. This, that's how I like to think about the swap function. So else you return and then continue releasing both forks after dancing. So annotations are gone here. I then choose a very simple, you know, based on Lady Gaga lyrics, uh, the choose move, you know, you have five moves. You have dancing moves with your hands, 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 their head, 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 their hips, 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 or even they'll go outside or dance on the dance floor. And they basically keep on dancing. So the dancer, you know, starts to dance. Then after 30 seconds, the dancer finishes dancing. And because they don't have any partners left to dance with, they leave the prom and have a good night. Don't worry, there's no after prom in this one. And then finally, there's a main function. So you use a threading dot semaphore for, and it showed about 20 dancers. So not that many, because I know Jen Ortega had plenty of space to dance. I tell you, back in my prom, it was like basically a COVID-19 quarantine. It's like, it was like sardines packed in a tuna can. It was it was hard to move around for dancing. If me and partner were future spouse do end up getting, uh, you know, in a wedding, I would absolutely make sure the wedding floor does not have like no space. Make sure everybody enjoys that dance. Because if we dance without social distancing, without any, you know, space, it's, uh, it's a little bit too close for comfort, as you say. It'll be like... It'll be a non, uh, it'll be a hard time uh, in terms of moving. So now we bust out the moves, you know, we keep on dancing. Then Professor Principal Weem said, we're done with the problem, have a good night. And we run the main. So let me show you right now how this is going to work. I'll run a version of this, and this is shown exactly the same as my story. I'll continue the song from Lady Gaga with the uh, chorus, and then I'll tell you right now, it's going to go past the end of a song. So bear with me for this one. So I'll stop share again. I'll reshare the screen this time with audio so I can show you how it's going to work choreographically. So I'll begin the program here. You can see the dance has begun, guys. So you can see dancer one is dancing, dancer zero is dancing. So all dancer one, his girlfriend, dancer zero, his partner, dancer two, all of them, the four some are dancing. Then dancer one continues to start dancing and dancer three starts dancing. Dancer zero is like, no, nah, I want to bust some moves. So I'm switching with dancer one. Then dancer four to six is dancing. Then they swap moves. So it's very complicated if you don't use semaphores. So just in general, the solution works for any n number of dancers, as long as you have the pigeonhole principle. There are more dancers than seats in the Nevermore Academy. And eventually, Principal Wim says, yeah, we're done with the dance. Have a good night. And we finish the dancing, leave the prom, and yada, yada, yada. So that's it. And the program's not yet done running. But I'll tell you right now, 
there can be a case of deadlock, which is a boo party pooper, but there is a case of deadlock. If you end up having the same exact number of dancers swap moves, which worst case scenario was that every single dancer had already done their dance, dance, dance with the hands, hands, hands above the heads, 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 like, you know, Jesus said, whatever. So like everybody has done their dancing, everybody's done their prom dancing, but unfortunately, Principal Williams cannot determine who stopped dancing and who can end the prom. So that's what ended up in the very deadly term called deadlock, which is the bane of existence in systems programming. Avoid deadlocks, just like Joe Maz should not avoid timeouts. That's a little bit of a Boston Celtics rant in game seven. So yes, I am one of those Celtics fans. Even in Orlando, I still show a little bit of Boston sports rage. I don't think this should have gone to seven this year. It should have already been done in like a couple days ago. Anyway, avoid deadlocks um, in your code. Because if you have deadlocks, it's not going to go very well for you. So you can see this thing's still running pretty, pretty long. But eventually it'll stop. So let me talk a little bit more about semaphores. <laughs> There are mainly two types of semaphores in computer science. There's commonly called write semaphore and read semaphore. And there's also something called mutexes, which is mutually exclusive uh, resource locks. And there you go. Everybody's done dancing, we're happy. So if you wanna learn more about semaphores and mutexes, don't worry, I'll put in descriptions and Wikipedia links. So finally wrap up the episode and also show a little bit of how come uh, Game Grumps is so funny. I'm gonna have you the hill to low rule castle one. This is the final coding of the episode. So you have Hilda's castle Airbnb rental, Free Mother's Day, and the Game Grumps. So if you saw the very funny uh Game Grumps gaming, you'll know that Aaron and um Aaron and his friend love, I turned out, they were like having the time of their lives, love the um, Hilda's little cats because it's so unbelievably bad to rent. He cannot believe a place like that exists. Even Airbnb like would not sponsor this type of dwelling. So hot floors, spacious, purple hamburger monster in the basement. So, you know, Princess Hilda is trying to hilariously trying to sell her castle in Laurel um, on Airbnb. Apparently, people don't take kindly to humor than COVID, and Hilda is left empty handed. It's the end of the game, it was post games, you know, Link defeated Yuga Ganon, and no nowhere, nowhere to connect the uh, portals. What's the poor princess supposed to do? So, luckily, Hilda have her son, so we're not involving any inappropriate uh, relations between family. We're just having good old mother and son time. I knew educated and co op the Hylian Computing LLC, a fake Hyrule co op, I guess. Um, his name is Ravio. Yeah, the, the Ravio guy that takes away your stuff if you get game over in uh, Link Between Worlds. However, Ravio tries to be secretive and Steph instructs Hilda how to sell a castle in, a form, in the form of a homeowner and tenant networking chat. So like basically there's, you know, a homeowner and a tenant and a series of call functions and a main. So Hilda is not a computer science buff, it's up to us, I'll go and 10 people. Even with the power of the Triforce and Google and the Hylian network, can, cannot idea, has no idea what she's doing and she wants us to help us figure out. So originally, we we're supposed to unplug the entire thing, like how Link kills the soldiers and blah, blah, blah. I feel like that's just too much. It's like a semester project. Because of bonus algos, I could implement everything else live. But one could implement the rental acceptance and denial of the tenant deal. And this does get into more, you know, dysentery stuff. So we designed the chat so it follows the TCP UDP network convention. So basically talk about like routing, um, talk about packets and routing. Yet in this episode, don't worry about routing or packets. Just get the transmission working between the server, which is Hilda and the client, the tenant. So give you a quick, very simple annotation here. Like super simple annotation. I'll give you a quick annotation here. Very super simple, like super simple one from whiteboard. So 
So I'm gonna clear this, I'm gonna save this actually, and then clear this. So here's a really simple annotation. You have Hilda, you have a tenant. So Hilda's like, hey, some, you know, castle for sale. And tenant could either accept or reject the castle sale. Um, if the tenant accepts the sale, which would be awesome, because then Hilda doesn't have to worry about money being wasted. He can basically do the following. He can determine the monthly rental price for the sale. So lower castle is not entirely for free. You do have to pay some monthly rent. If he rejects it because, you know, one of his friends or partners or somebody died from the lower castle because, you know, Moldorm, the purple hamburger monster, or somebody killed them, uh, he could tell the reason why he rejected it. So that's basically the very simple decision tree. And this will go on recursively until basically Hilda and the tenant run out of space in terms of like negotiating. So it's like a back and forth type of thing. So enough talking, let's show the code. So the code is very interesting. I first used TypeScript, which is like a throwback to Northeastern's FSC course. So shout out to Professor Wand, uh, Bell, and Tip for giving me the um, motivation from Northeastern years from grad school to do TypeScript. So I have two main classes. I have a Hilda class for Princess Hilda. And I have a tenant class for the tenant. I basically create several um, private and public variables. I did basically determine a chat says to be Laurel Castle available for rent. And for reason, generally for Hilda reasons to like, you know, talk about whether to accept or reject um, the offer from the tenant is no. And because, you know, Hilda is renting this Airbnb, she has to get some rent, right? The tenant either, you know, gives her the rent for Laurel Castle, which is going to be true, or Hilda rejects it instead. I have a really simple constructor telling the reason whether the rent's been accepted or denied. So here's some methods. I told you, you could look at the switch statement. That switch statement right there shows that we have a decision tree. So that's why I've been like mentioning trees and pretty much recursion for the entire episode and semaphores and like mutexes and switches. They're all recursive structures. Recursion is not just all about, you know, damn it programming, um, trying to ace code using crazy, crazy uh, callbacks. It's also about making smart decisions as well. And, and this is also very important for analytics because you always want to make sure the decision you make is the decision you'll keep. So we have a rupee, you know, in Hyrule, things are being paid in rupees. If you basically are running out of rupees or some stupid black rupee took away all your rupees, you can't make a deal anymore. You have to go bye-bye or you have to buy some rupees and I don't know, smash some pots or bargain with Hyrule Castle management. Otherwise, if you have all the, you know, the rupees you have, you could buy everything for maximum of 999 being the entire castle itself. Otherwise, if all the cases don't work, you have a default case, you cannot buy the castle at all, say sorry, and it's break. And if you have any rupees, you can basically make a deal with Hilda. So you can accept the deal and uh, Hilda receives the tenant. And the Tulsa Hilda receives the um, deal from the tenant. And of course, I've been here at six months in Orlando, so I choose six months, usually enough to gauge a new dwelling for rent or in my case, a new house. I know this economy right now, getting housing is tough. So I'm making only six months for um, the tenant. So the monthly rental would be rupee plus 400 because you wanna make sure you have exactly 400 um, rupees per month. And in times the number of months, you're gonna be renting for rupees. And of course, to be courteous, Hilda thanks you for doing business with her in highly computing LLC. However, you're being a very picky person or somebody got killed or, you know, just like game grumps. There's like all sorts of mishaps, like the floor full of lava, the mold dorm, Aaron, you know, just going crazy. Uh, people might reject the deal. And that's going to give you something called reimbursement. So you reimburse. That means the Hilda and her management gives you back the money. So I cannot believe it, guys. I'll go to 10 before Mother's Day. I'm doing economy over here. I'm doing economics. This is my first ever economics-based um, algos because right now I'm realizing it's Mother's Day and my mom, you know, wants me to do all my new um, new life, new house. Um, this house, I got to pay some rent. So reimbursement is a key. 
So, you know, switch the reason. Uh, you know, the floor burned, burned all my clothes, which is terrible. You reimburse 100 rupees. Modem tries to attack you, 200 rupees. Argus and jellyfish give you electric shock, 300 rupees. It gets worse and worse and worse. So basically, I took get arson. My room caught on fire. The lava floor is disabled. Can't get out of a room. I was burned. You almost burned to death. 500 rupees. If you basically get any of the troubles at all in the lower castle, Hilda will give you a reimbursement. So she'll say, sorry to hear that. We'll reimburse you with the reimbursement of rupees. And you'll still say, oh, I hope you enjoy the low rule. Now, for the tenant, it's only one function, because tenant only does one thing. Does this castle suck or not, basically? Give the reviews. And unlike Yelp reviews, it's not biased. So the tenant uses something in TypeScript called a big integer array. So a little bit of an integer array review here from CS210. Um, yes. So you know how usually arrays work, right? In terms of memory. You have like a block of memory here. As I recall from my computing years in school, an int is 32 bits. A double is 64 bits. And of course, you know, back in computing, one byte equals eight bits. So how about big integer? So big integer in TypeScript, and let me just quickly ask ChatGPT for this. So I'm going to use a little bit of ChatGPT here to help me out here, so I don't cheat. So you have a bunch of you know prompts with chat GPT. Let me let me ask the prompt. How many bits are in a big integer? So this is a very cool use of AI, you know. Determine some answers. I hope ChatGPT is smarter than my professors, actually, but we'll see. So, you have basically two to the power 32 minus one for two's complement bits. So this is a little bit of a two's complement review for padding in uh, computing systems. So there you go, that's what you have. Sorry, I don't want the photos here. Anyways, that's how you get the TypeScript bits. So continue on episode, wrap it up before I go to sleep. I have then, you know, helper methods, which is chat reviews given. You have three main variables. You have Hilda, Princess Hilda, tenant to tenant buying the Loro Castle or renting it at least, and reviews. So basically, if the tenant's a newbie, you know, hasn't done any reviews or already denies the, the uh, offer from Hilda or just does not give a damn about their deal, they give zero. Otherwise, they basically go, you know, the star rating. If there's 10 reviews on a particular accommodation for Loro Castle or anywhere in Loro Rule, like for example, the Dark Palace or God forbid the Ice Palace, um, you give one star rating, two, three, four, five, otherwise no reviews given. Mm -hmm. So here's a little sample main I use. So this is where it gets into some call stack recursion. I have a Hilda object, a tenant object, a constructor, which basically runs everything. So in TypeScript, you don't have any print statements. You only have console.logs. 
If you have Hilda and Tennant, then if both cases agree, you accept the deal. Both cases disagree, you deny the deal. Otherwise, you, you know, Taja Huanja bargain the deal. So Hilda the tenant rent received, Hilda the chat deal accepted, tenant deal accepted, and chat reviews given. If I had given a review, then you know, close the deal. Otherwise, reject the deal. And that's it. That's it for Algos and Ten, season four, episode four. So hope you guys, you know, respect your parents, either, you know, mother, or if you don't have a mother, um, your female um partner, uh, your wife, your spouse, your fiance, just respect the, the female people in your um community, really. And to wrap it up, I'm gonna finish it off with a little more marimba. So that's it for the episode, guys. So hopefully it's not game seven tomorrow. And for Father's Day, Fujin Jie, we'll have the uh, season, season four, episode five, which is my, my, my dad's favorite activity, fishing. And also a warning about fishing as well for computer security. See you guys then. Oh, dance, dance, dance with my hands, hands, hands above my head, 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 like Jesus said. Oh, dance, dance, dance with my hands, 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 look above my head. So, yeah, there I go. So, have a good evening, guys, and you know, a happy Mother's Day for those who celebrate. See ya. <laughs>